Wow, we get to talk about fun stuff at this conference, isn't that right? We just get, it's, this is, this is the kind of thing you talk over Thanksgiving dinner because everyone will be comfortable and excited talking about it, right? <laughs> well, the truth is we do need to be doing, have, having a lot of conversations because so much of our culture is being overwhelmed by its, a, a sexualized culture. And our girls are, and boys from a young age are seeing things that, well, many of you never saw at their age. And so we've got to have conversations, and, uh, and not just about pornography, but about our culture overall. And that's what this whole session is about. It's about how can we uh, take topics that our moms and dads probably would have not discussed with us, and uh, we can turn that into more of a casual learning conversation that you can have over time. And some of you may or may not be inter uh, know what Covenant Eyes is. Uh, Covenant Eyes is Internet Accountability and Filtering Software, and we've been doing this since 2000. It is our mission and passion, and we have the audacity to believe that we can help change culture with people like you. Um, we teamed up with the National Center on Sexual Exploitation about, I guess it's been a little over four years ago now. And we trained Google's executive team on the impact pornography was having on children, and spe specifically, that's when Google agreed that they would no longer sell pornography advertising or advertising to pornography websites. So all that, the pornography advertising has actually gone away from, from Google. When you open up your Android device and look through the apps, there's no longer um, app, pornography apps. There used to be lots of them. I remember being in a, at, a, at a choir concert for my, for my daughter, I believe, and uh, I was overhearing the mom in front of me saying, you know, I just downloaded Facebook to uh, my child's phone, and right next to it was this crazy straight-up pornography app. How is this possible? How are we putting this, these devices in our kids' hands? So I helped her out a little bit there. But we together can make an impact on our culture. And organizations like UCAP and the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, can we work together to have an impact and influence on our culture. So what you learn here, I hope you'll find ways to expand on and share with others. We are at no lack for talking about taboo subjects in the news today, right? Uh, here's the, the, some of the headlines that I picked up just this morning. Um, the actor, uh, Jesse, what's his name, in Chicago, who's now being charged with a, making a false police report. R. Kelly, R&B singer, former professional basketball player, charged with 10 counts of sexual abuse, three for children under 17. A Tennessee lawmaker, David Byrd, he was re-elected uh, in November by a 56% margin, even though he faces and continues to face sexual assault allegations. While he was a basketball coach, he was alleged to, to have... Um, sexually assaulted girls on his team. Patriots owner Robert Kraft was arrested for soliciting prostitution. How do you talk about that with your kids, right? Well, we really, we really need to. But the first question you might be asking is, why in the world would I do that? Let's keep their innocence Let's ignore the world around us, and I suspect that they'll figure it out on their own. Sounds like a bad idea, doesn't it? We do not want to remove the ignorance from our, or the innocence from our children. We want to remove their ignorance so that they can help protect their innocence. That's why we ha uh, have great 
uh, organizations out there like Educate and Power Kids and Good Pictures, Bad Pictures or Protect Young Minds to give uh, resources that help mom and dad teach their kids even what pornography is at a young age because if we don't teach them, the rest of our culture will. We have an opportunity to train our sons and our daughters to not fall into mistakes. I don't want my son falling into error because he's getting the wrong information from his peers. The United Kingdom last, uh, was it last year? I think it was 2017. They released a report that showed a 300% increase on child-on-child -child sexual assault over that five-year period. Children are seeing the most inappropriate stuff on their online, on uh, mobile devices. We give our children the largest library of pornography ever created in the history of mankind, and we say, listen, just look at the good stuff, because you wouldn't be curious like we were curious when we were at your age, right? We need to arm our, our sons to be the heroes, to stand up against a culture that degrades. We need to arm our daughters to know that they can stand up for themselves and be honored and be respected. I remember I got, uh, you know, coming to the eyes, I get reports from my kids, right, when they're growing up. Probably one of the best tools I ever had as a parent was getting a report that shows how my kids were using the internet. It would show me what sites were blocked, and as well as it would show me the actual individual pages that had been viewed. We're the only ones in the world that rate the pages on the internet like you would see for video games and television shows, like youth, ma teen, mature teen, mature, highly mature. And so I get my daughter's report, and she has said, wow, I just got to do a real quick survey of the audience here. Okay, it looks like all adults in this room. Yeah? Okay, raise hands if not. <laughs> Baby in the back, watch out. Um, <laughs> uh, and she has posted, why do guys get laid and girls get screwed? Now, I don't mean that, say that out that way to, to shock you. I'm just, this is real life. I mean, you would think that nothing ever bad happens in Sam's home because everything is just picture perfect, everything's okay, never, no issues ever come up, right? No, not true. My home is just like your home. And I, when I saw that, I thought, grounding until she's about 32 seems about right. I think that would be a good idea. And, uh, but I really felt, uh, through my faith, the Lord speaking to me and saying, this is your opportunity. Step up. Be the dad. And so my wife and I sat down with her that night, and we said, okay, Hannah, uh, Give us a little feedback here. Why is that true? Now, that was the last question she expected to ask. Why is that true? And she said, Dad, I overheard some boys talking in our neighborhood, and it made me so angry because women are treated as sexual objects. And it's, I'm, I'm really just kind of furious at the world we live in, in our culture that we live in, that there is a double standard, and I get to be on the poor side of that standard, and I don't like it. I said, absolutely, you're absolutely right. And we gave you know, some biblical perspective on there. We talked about how women should be honored and treated. We talked about how we begin confronting our culture. Now, she gets excited at this point. And she's, I'm pretty sure she's about to get up on the kitchen or on, the, on the, the coffee table and like throwing it out there, preaching a sermon, right? And then I pulled out uh, some other pop music that she'd been listening to on YouTube. And I said, you know, I, I just really, I can't be more proud of you in taking this stand. But you know what? I printed out the lyrics to the YouTube videos that you're watching would you read those for me? That's okay, honey. I'll read them to you. 
And, uh, and so I said, wait a minute. You said women should be honored and treated and respected like this, but that's not what this says. And she goes, I get it, Dad. Now, I can tell you we had lots of conversations about what kind of shows we watch in our home, what kind of music we listen to. But it was a whole different scenario when it had something to do with her real life. And I said, "Hun, every time that you click on that link, I think she's about 13 or 14 at this time, I said, every time you click, you're voting. And you're telling a, an industry, make more music like this, write more lyrics like this, this is what women deserve. This is all women really want. And you can stand either one, go along with your culture, or you can stand up to it. Are you going to confront your culture, or are you going to go along with your culture? Now, I can tell you that must have been one of the most impactful uh, conversations I had with her. Because she's 23 now, and in, going to be 23 this year, in college. And her fiancé uses covenant eyes. Because she says, well, I'm going to get a report about what you do online, and we're just going to never have this be part of our problem going into marriage. That to see that, um, I said, like, I like to listen to her music, and I really like it. And she's already introducing me to new artists that are respectful of others. We need to train and equip our kids to have, with, and with these conversations, to understand that there is value in their personal boundaries, that we can confront our culture. We can set expectations in our home and not let the culture set the expectations for what we do and see online and not allow, just allow their peers to be setting the expectations for what, how we use our devices. We can share our values. Now, I'm going to give a couple of just thrown out piece of advice here, but I'm going to encourage you not to give a smartphone to your kids until they're about 13, maybe 14. And that sounds like you will be in the doghouse. And I've lived there, and it was worth it. If you can get a dumb flip phone, use it. Now, I'm saying this, and I am selling you software to protect your kids, right? So wherever you're at, OK. Um, if you need our services, use them. Use them well, but use them to have an ongoing conversation with your kids. You can use the filtering to block the bad stuff, but the accountability is where you're using it to have an ongoing conversation with your kids about the world they live in. Do we have any homeschool parents in here? Yeah, great. I speak at a lot of homeschool conferences, and um, one of the biggest fears is, oh, I have, I, I have a teach this subject too. This is one more thing I, I've got to teach. Um, really what I want you to do is integrate it into your daily communications, your monthly communications. You actually might write down some specific topics that, hey, I'm going to do some research on this kind of issue, and I'm going to set aside some time to, to talk about that and put, write it on a calendar because if you don't do that, uh, you'll find lots of time goes by and nothing's actually been done. Capitalize on what your kids see and hear. They're hearing all kinds of stuff. I remember um, my son got home from camp, and I think he is 10 or 11, and he throws out a really crass word. And, uh, and we're driving down the road, and I try not to drive you know, into the ditch, but I said, oh, well, he says, Dad, what does this mean? And he just kind of blurts it out. And uh, I said, well, where did you hear that? And uh, what's going on? And then we actually turned that into a conversation, and I told him what it meant. There, so he would have a clear understanding, and, a, and it was always clear, always come to me and your mom, and we will answer your questions. Don't go ask Google, and don't go ask your peers, but we'll be up front with you. Uh, creating that trusting environment to have, to be able to ask 
for them to ask questions and for it to, them to really get answers. So when's it appropriate? This is probably one of the most common themes that you get from, from moms and dads, like when do we start having these kinds of conversations? Well, at age two to six, um, you can have conversations that help them understand their boundaries. You need to help them understand where their bathing suit area is and where, why that should be private. You want to arm them that they can be very, they, they can always come to you and this really works. I mean, kids, when they're trained at this age, will actually come directly to you and do what you told them to do. Uh, and I'll give you an illustration of that in a, in a little bit. We need to limit what they consume. Um, it's interesting that kids can operate, there was a university study that showed kids were able to operate a mouse before they could tie their shoe. Operate a mouse before they could tie their shoe. We, as parents, have gotten a little lazy with technology and where we used to do a lot more pack and play stuff where you had the coloring books or whatever else for the back seat. Instead, we're handing them an iPad and say, entertain yourself. Find, here's a game that you can play where there are some things that are fine that way. If you can lock down your device well, and you can do it, then it's not so much that touching the bad screen, it's allowing unfettered access. Always be sure to find out what they know. Uh, keep it simple. Make sure you're giving them uh, proper body names for their, their body parts. And again, making sure that bathing suit area is private. Seven to 12 year olds, again, a very influential period in their life where you can, they really listen to you it's, it's on this period. They, they really are more attuned to, they, they still think mom and dad know something. That mom and dad might be kind of smart now and again. Some kids at the bottom end of this range still have difficulty on knowing what's real and what's pretend. That two to six year old group, you tell them the uh, garden hose is a snake and they might jump back or shriek. They, they will believe you. Not so with the seven to 12 year olds. Older ones are, think, having, uh, are, are getting abstract thinking skills. They're getting real world experience. They're having an ability to express themselves, their own humor, etc. And they're about to enter puberty and we really have to arm them so that they know what's coming at them. Now, um, I was doing a session at uh, one year at a, if you've never been to a homeschool conference, there are they're a hoot. Have you ever been to one of these? So like in Florida, uh, 15,000 people show up to that. 15,000 people show up to a homeschool conference in Florida. And so I did a session on, on how do we uh, train our kids and prepare for them for the day that they see pornography. And this is a book that I highly recommend from uh, Protect Young Eyes or Protect Young Minds. And um, and so we'd gone through those lessons, and this seven-year-old is, again, they, if you train them, they, they will follow that instruction. So this seven-year-old, uh, her son, she, she, uh, I'm sorry, i got to start over again. So this woman comes running up to my booth, mom, and she says, we did exactly what you said. We used the Good Pictures, Bad Pictures book. We uh, began having conversations using Covenant Eyes to, about what they see and do online. And through those conversations, we just, we made it ongoing. My seven-year-old son was just exposed to pornography. And, uh, but she's happy about it, so <laughs> something's got to be right here. And she says, well, he was over at another seven-year-old boy's house, and that seven-year-old boy who had just gotten an iPad for his birthday has gone from I don't know anything about sex to hardcore pornography, and he's doing this to my son. Look what I found. And that seven-year-old goes, 
no, that's pornography. And he turns and he runs back home and he tells mom and dad what happened. With a little bit of, of digger deeping after they congratulate him and say just how thankful they were that he did the, the right thing, uh, they talk to the mother, mom and dad, and it so happens that this seven-year-old has exposing nine, eight, and 11-year-olds throughout the neighborhood. At least five kids. And the only one who said anything was the one who was trained, who had turned taboo topics into conversations to teach, train, and disciple their kids. We can train our kids well. Who would like this? But who has young kids? Young. Right here. This is yours in the red shirt. Yeah. Who? <laughs> who? Teenagers. Now, this is uh, the part of the time where they're, re they're really thinking independently now. They're deforming their own opinions. They care about um, what their peers think a lot. They're interacting with media on their own, often. They're creating their own, and they're sharing it online. They often hear about very difficult subjects through the news media, through video games, through their social media, and a lot of it's without any knowledge from you. You're not part of the, you're not, <laughs> you're not on the inside loop, a lot of the information they're getting. And they care a lot about what their friends think. On the lower part of the spectrum, still it's easier to have this conversation. They're getting 17, 18, well, they sort of think they already know what they need to know and what you have to tell them probably isn't nearly as important. But you can still, if, if you're treating this very respectful, and especially if you start young, they'll just kind of get accustomed to the idea that, well, dad's always, mom and dad are always kind of starting these conversations and, and I get to have input. And that's very important that they get to own their opinions, they get to own them, and though you can express your ideas or opinions, that doesn't mean they have to adopt your opinions. If you get mad when your teenager is telling you something that you don't quite agree with, you're shutting down the whole conversation moving forward. So if there might be times that you're gonna to have to agree to disagree, because you might remember those lectures from your dad. And those weren't too exciting either, right? Um, be free, Here, here's a great way to ear, earn points with teens is, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I really have to think about that or I need to do some research on that. Uh, they respect it when you say, I, I don't know. But I'll find out, I'd like to talk to you more about that later. Too often as uh, parents, we're very tempted to know everything, <laughs> right? And we don't need to know everything, but uh, be able to be vulnerable enough to, 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 to discuss that and be vulnerable enough to admit to maybe mistakes in ways that we didn't understand things as well. Challenge your teens to uh, consider the complexities of issues. Ask them what they would do. Challenge them to consider other solutions. I was watching the news and um, there was Congressman Feinstein. She's a Democrat, probably extremely liberal, but she was being uh, a bunch of teenagers and young kids came into her office and they're like, if you don't do this, we're pushing you out. Well, they can't vote, but um, it was, and she says, <laughs> and she didn't handle it very well. She's getting a lot of uh, grief on this because she's like, you know, when you guys come in here and say it's my way or the highway, that doesn't very really play very well with me. And uh, it's not that she's wrong, but there's an understanding there where we need to listen and give feedback and challenge them to consider 
real solutions um, when it comes to things is like trafficking. How can we help in our community? What could you do to change that in our, in our state or in our local community? There's a, some difficulties that we have with our kids. John Fort, by the way, has, is writing a new book. In fact, he's written a new book called Honest Talk. And in that book, um, he addresses lots of ways you can have conversations with your kids, really understanding their emotions and, and et cetera. And John has a booth, it's right through here, it's called Be Broken, uh, Be Broken Ministries, and go up to him and say, John, I was in Sam Black's class, and he said I, uh, there might be a way to get a free book. Now, there's no way you're going to get a free book, but you'll scare him really bad that I said that. So try, try that out on him. Just, just see if you can spook him. Say, hey, Sam said, I, can I get a free book? And, and know that you can't, but it'll really, it'll really spook him. But he talks about... Uh, the prefrontal cortex of the brain is where we think, we make our decisions. The problem is that doesn't form until you're about 25 years old, somewhere between 22 and 25. So the thought process that will regulate emotions and decision making and, and how you consider the consequences, this doesn't, this doesn't get fully developed until about 22 to 25. Meanwhile, you have this limbic system brain that is all about excitement and reward and novelty and risk. I am surprised to this day that I am standing in front of you knowing what my teenage years were like. Um, I got a driver's license and we lived out in the country and if four wheels weren't off the ground, I didn't think we were actually driving the truck. You know, it was just like, you know, and uh, it was all about, and that's where a lot of our uh, older tweens, and especially teenagers, are. They're, they're, there's, there's a separation between risk and reward-seeking behavior and the forethought and regulating emotions. So what does this have to do with taboo topics? What does it have to do with our, our sexualized culture? Their sexualized culture is saying, go for it. Their thinking brain isn't developed. So we're saying, daughter, son, that's dangerous. You're talking to people online that you don't even know who they are. Or, son, you are thinking that, you know, I uh, had an eight-year-old boy. This is too young for this. This is, he's not even registering on here. I'll go to another boy. He was 12. And um, I just had a habit of scooping up devices when they came in my home. And I scooped up his iPod. And the first thing out of his mouth was, my brother's been home from the Navy, and I don't know what he's been doing on my device. Well, I was pretty sure what I would find, and it was. It was covered in hardcore pornography. And, uh, and he was his... He was in here, the reward, risk and reward seeking, a kid that came from a very faithful family. Uh, but his forethought and understanding the issues at hand, he also doesn't have life experience. His mom and dad haven't, said it, haven't taught him or warned him yet. So this is what you're also having to deal with when you're talking to your teenager and they're like, Mom, Dad, you're just fuddy-duddies. You just don't get it. I like the risk of it. And there's a reason they like the risk of it. That brain isn't, isn't giving the forethought. It's not regulating their emotions. It's not giving the decision-making. It's focused, especially, uh, well, they're being impulsive. They're driven by reward. And, oh, isn't it romantic? Do you remember being a teenager and having a crush? Do you remember that? Oh, come on. Am I the only one? She was the most beautiful girl in the world. And, you know, we're just so caught up. My wife is the most beautiful woman in the world. 
but for so many more reasons than just her physical beauty. Uh, 24 years of marriage have cemented those bonds, that thinking part of my brain that um, there's so much more that we've shared. Teens are missing that. All right. Well, let's get some sources, some sources to where you can have an ongoing conversation that's going to be a little more risk-free. Let me tell you something. If you're thinking that um, Fox News is a great place to get your news, especially online, I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, it's terrible. Uh, Fox News, especially online, has more disgusting uh, things about people who do porn, they call them porn stars, and about their relationships or what the last thing they did and uh, who they're involved with now and they're like they're celebrities. It's constant on Fox News. Don't use Fox News to try to treat your kids about what is morally right uh, and how women and men should be honored in our culture today. Believe it or not, the New York Times has something called the Learning Network. You can find it, and I've got a slide that's going to show you this in a minute, the newyorktimes.com forward slash section forward slash learning. It is designed for um, teens. Mature tweens might also be fine there as well, but you have to decide for your mature tween what that looks like. And what I often encourage uh, parents to do, especially for tweens, mature tweens, is to go and read a story first and then review it, take some notes, and then retell that article in your own words. You're doing a little bit of editing. In this case, you're having to do less of it. If you're going mainstream kinds of news, you might need to change some things because of the way it's presented. Don't dumb it down. Help them learn new vocabulary. Harassment is a big long word, but they can know what it means. So we de help define these new words. Just another page. They did. They do some. They've done some really uh, nice, some nice articles, especially toward the hashtag Me Too movement. Uh, some additional. Uh, Websites are really geared toward younger readers. Again, we talked about New York Times. Um, maybe you like God's World News, Dogo News. Very family friendly, well edited for that age group. Time for Kids, Time Magazine. Again, great resources. Anybody else have um, done anything like this and they have a, a website they like to review with their kids for news? I'm sorry? Very good. I'm not, um, I think I've perused it before. Uh, the question was, um, what about CNN? It says like there's one for like 11 to 12 year olds. The best thing you can do for any of these kinds of sites, go read it, look at it, see if it fits the dynamics of your home. You might say, Sam, I don't agree with the New York Times. I'm not, that's not, doesn't fit with our family. That is your decision. That's your choice. So you need to decide that for your family. Simple guides and examples. So we're just going to walk through, maybe play with this a little bit. You know, um, it's always handy to have a little warm-up, especially for younger kids. And a warm-up looks a little bit like uh, begin asking what they know. Maybe they, you, they bring home from school. Maybe they have, uh, um, you know, those little news sheets they br kids bring home from school. Maybe there's a topic in there that's, well, what have you learned about that? What do you know about that? What do your friends say about that? Maybe your teacher talked to you about? And really kind of, kind of warm up 
uh, to what they know. Prompt their thinking, and you might start by asking, what have you, you know, if we're going to talk about the topic, for instance, of, of sexual harassment, what have you heard or learned about that? Uh, what do you know about the hashtag Me Too movement? How do you feel about that? Now, they may be clueless, and you can start there. Start small, and you can build over time. Um, but little, you know, address it to their age and their ability and their knowledge and their also their maturity. This kind of gets a little fascinating to know that um, sexual harassment was a term that was in, first came in the 1970s out of Miss Magazine. We kind of get the impression that we've thought of all this stuff up in the last five or six years, and that's not true. This, these issues have been going on along, along for a while. Why haven't we done better at addressing them? What, uh, imagine taking uh, kind of an exploratory tour with your, with your teen daughter or, or son and ask them, well, just what did you see that was different about the Anita Hill testimony in 1991 versus conversations that are happening today? The uh, Tarana Burke, I think I have her, this, I'll come back to that one. How is it possible that our chosen Olympians, the ones we were so, you know, did so, you know, so proud of, are being abused by a doctor who's trusted? How can we turn that into a conversation that says, here's where your boundaries are, and you can always come to someone who's safe if something doesn't seem right. You can always raise your hand when things don't look right. And using this to say, I'm going to believe you, because these girls weren't believed for years. This is a great search, uh, and you can listen to um, um, this video. I think it'd be a great uh, kind of exercise if you're like, well, I want to just one, you know, give me one thing that I can do with my teens. Uh, Tarana Burke is the founder of the hashtag Me Too movement. And you would think, yeah, that, so that happened, what, uh, 2017, right? No, she was saying this, uh, these words in 2006. She had been running healing circles in Philadelphia and Alabama for girls who had been sexually abused and sexually assaulted. And she'd been doing this from 1998 to 2015. And... Um, so when this, her hashtag Me Too movement kind of got adopted, she said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We, she said it scared me at first because now it could be misinterpreted and not understood well. And how do we, how do we help women who are, go, who are going through this trauma and telling, now they're going to tell their stories and deal with that trauma? How are we going to help them do that well? How about boys and, and, and men who have been abused how do we help them through those, not just say, let's tell our story, but how do we help them for the long run? So listening to this video, you can find it on YouTube, but just, it'll be, I think, the number one thing that pops up, how did the hashtag Me Too movement start? And if you listen to her speak, you'll be like, oh, that's clear. I can, I can really, and then understand, then we turn that into a conversation. How could we make things change in our own community and our own neighborhoods. Again, asking open-ended questions because you want to get a conversation going. You don't want to do a lecture. Yes, please. How to educate your child the question is, how could we educate our, our child who's now a college student, they've moved away, they're a young man or young woman, 
Um, I'm going to say it depends a lot. It depends a lot on your relationship. It depends a lot about if there are issues that have gone on in the home or has it been a safe home? Has it always been a home where it's been easy to have these conversations? If that's the case, then likely they're pretty still open to that. Um, a lot of kids are like, you know, I don't need any more sex talks or anything like that, but they might be willing to say, hey, uh, I text them, yeah, or share it through Messenger and say, you know, I, was, I thought this was really interesting. I'd love to hear your viewpoint on this. Not say, this is important, you need to watch this because um, I think you're on <laughs> the, <laughs> the worst track, right? Uh, ask their opinion. What are, you, what, are your, what are your feelings on this? How do you think that would... That's the way I would go. Where are we at on time? Ten minutes? Okay. I sent around... Uh, again, we talked about... It's great that we're having this conversation, but we also need to have some resources that we can depend on over time. So let me give you just a few resources I highly recommend. One, uh, where is that uh, sign-up sheet? Right awesome. Does anybody not get a chance to put their name and email address on there? She would like that too. And if you put your name and email address there, we'll send you a link. Again, you download more than 20 separate eBooks, video and other things. And, and once you might, uh, when you're ready, hold up the, the sheet and then someone else will raise their hand and you can pass it off to them because it looks like it got a little speckled in there. Good pictures, bad pictures. I already gave away one book. There is another book that's really geared more toward uh, the 10-year-old set. Who has kids in that age group? All right, right here. So uh, I can't recommend this book highly enough. And it, I think they're selling them for $12. It's their main booth out there. It's fantastic. And uh, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures books really helps kids understand what are good pictures and what are bad pictures, what do we see online or, or at other friends' house or etc. and what do we do if we see something inappropriate. We can really uh, have a good conversation there with your kids and they will follow this. It's really incredible. Uh, and by the way, it's a, it's a read-along book, so you read it with your kids, right? Hal and Melanie Young do a really cool thing um, in, called Raising Real Men. And they have lots of, uh, one of their books is called Raising a Modern Day Knight. Great resource for your teen son. The National Center for Exploitation, that is in sexualexploitation.org. Lots of great resources, lots of great ways to get your tween or teen involved in addressing things like trafficking and make, you know, one of the things he did this past year was now Cosmopolitan in Walmart is no longer at the checkout counter. It is in the magazine separate rack. So no longer do our little toddlers have to come by in the checkout line to see Cosmo right there. Those are some great initiatives. They had also had an initiative where uh, they helped Hyatt, Hilton, Sheraton, Sherwood, Holiday Inn, and other hotel chains one by one agree that they would no longer sell pornography in hotel rooms. Isn't that awesome? I, I actually make a regular donation to them. I love what they do. Uh, good pictures, bad pictures, I told you about that. This is a brand new book that's coming out mid-April. Great opportunity, falls right in line with what we've been talking today. Uh, conversations with my kids, 30 essential family discussions for the digital age. Misspelling on digital age, but that's not my fault. I was, <laughs> and I'm sure that they'll correct it before it comes out. But <laughs> go, when you go over to their booth, they're straight out this way against the far wall and say, hey, I noticed the misspelling on your book, and it'll scare them really well. But I have three of their books, and I love what they're doing. Um, if you have a younger kid who's getting a new phone, would anyone like this book? Right back there. Would you come up and grab it? 
um, how to talk to your children about pornography. This is a guide to how am I going to talk about that? There you go. And finally, I've got one more that's really geared toward this. It is uh, understanding digital media. And doesn't every, our, our daughters especially, need to understand the difference that this is the same person? This is the same person, right? You can get these books straight out there. And by the way, I don't get any commission on this. I just love this stuff. You're welcome. Uh, another fabulous resource, culturereframe.org, culturereframe.org. They will walk you through step by step. They have video and all those other things that you can really turn these conversations very quickly. Intoxicated on Life, they have a great book there called um, um, well, I can't uh, remember what it's called, but it is a, the book on, that walks your kids through Identifying uh, sex, understanding how our bodies are designed, gives you the proper names, allows a very um, easy conversation to talk about how we're designed. Protect Young Eyes, we talked about them, and Educate and Empower uh, Kids, that's the books I just handed out too. This is all about creating that ongoing conversation. It is up to you. If there's one thing I've learned over 12 years at Covenant Eyes is that mom and dad are the greatest resource their kids have. It, we can use tools like Covenant Eyes. We can use tools like the books that I handed out here. But unless mom and dad take an active role and they're actually marking on their calendars and they're becoming the resource for their kids, all of this for naught. You are amazing parents. Please go amazing, be amazing for your kids. Thank you.